Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. We talk about this concept of a rainmaker versus an architect. And so a rainmaker is the person who is doing all the selling versus I'm an architect and I'm building a sales engine, a sales and lead generation engine that um, then allows the company to scale and to grow and to flourish and is not solely reliant on me. And it has an immediate impact in profits. It has an immediate impact in the value of the business. And most importantly, it has a, an immediate impact on your personal life and whether you can step away and, and, and take some time off to think about the business or make it make a bigger impact in the other things that you want to do. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Stefan Smulders of Expandy and with Arjun Sen of Zen Mango, then Check them out, but listen to today's conversation first, of course. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Pete Martin of Ask My Board. Pete is a seasoned executive and serial entrepreneur who has worked in sales, in operations and executive management for over 25 years. Over his career, he has been personally involved in the sales of over one billion dollars worth of software, services, and technology to global companies like Dow Chemical, Lockheed Martin, Goodyear, Eli Lilly, and Continental General Tire, as well as many small to medium-sized businesses. That's a pretty big hitting list there. Pete started, scaled, and sold four out of four previous companies, including car leasing, systems integration consulting, business process outsourcing, and software distribution. His most recent sale was to the global auditing giant KPMG. Pete has personally advised hundreds of C-level executives and business owners across 26 industries to grow their firms, enhance their business operations, and improve their financial performance. In our conversation today, Pete talked to me about taking the customer experience to a whole new level through obsessive customer focus. We talked about the role of the business owner as an architect rather than a rainmaker. And we talked about hiring for culture and defining the ideal team member. Without further ado, then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Pete Martin. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast all the way from Cleveland, Ohio, in the USA, Pete Martin of Ask My Board, which is a strategic growth and advisory exit firm, exit advisory firm that serves growth-minded entrepreneurs, business owners, and their teams. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Pete. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you, Jürgen. I'm uh, super honored, proud, and really excited about being on the show today. Now, Pete, you've personally advised hundreds of C-level executives and business owners across a whole range of industries, I think 26 or more, to grow their firms, enhance their business operations, and improve their financial performance, all, all wrapping up to um, being a much more healthy business and positioning it for exit. 
you're also host of the Uncommon Advice, Uncommon Results podcast. So I'm really excited to be speaking to you today and looking forward to digging into growing companies, um, getting uncommon growth and results and um, seeing where that leads us and what lessons we can take away. Before we do that, though, what what's the impact you're making in the world? Can you give us a kind of a snapshot of that? Yeah, so we, we serve two types of clients. One is that business owners that are focused on growing their business, either they're stuck in their business um, from a revenue perspective, a profit, a cash flow perspective, or frankly, they're just so tied to their business, they don't have any time to appreciate life. Um, and they may or may not be thinking about an exit. And an exit doesn't necessarily mean that you're selling your business to a third party. It could mean that you want to become the chairman of your firm and step away from the day-to-day -day operations. It could mean you want to turn the business over to your family, to your employees. There's lots of different ways to exit a business. And then we also serve clients that are very specifically focused on they're, they're, um, they're kind of done. They want to move on to a next chapter in their life. And they're very specifically putting a plan in place to go sell their business to a third party. And so um, the impact we make is a little bit different based on either one of those different scenarios. From the growth perspective, um, we, we have seen clients just basically be stuck at a certain revenue range level that have doubled, tripled, or quadrupled the, the revenue growth rates that they had seen historically. And then on the exit side, um, I've personally sold four of my previous companies. I've got two that are active right now, including Ask My Board. And I tell you, when you go to sell your business or any kind of an exit, frankly, most business owners, if they get the even opportunity to do that, they do it once, maybe twice in their life. And so they're at this huge disadvantage of playing in an industry or in a business, whether it's selling to a, with an M&A advisor or a venture capital firm or pre PE firm, whatever, you know, whatever that third party is, they're at a huge disadvantage because those guys do that for a living, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a business owner, you may get to do it once and you really only get one shot to do it. And so we've seen a huge impact in our ability to help owners get the maximum price and the best terms for their business. And as we can continue on through this interview, we'll, I'll tell you some of my personal stories about how I was able to do that in my last sale to KPMG and, and some of the tips and tricks we, we give business owners. So, mm, mm, Fascinating. Yeah, it's a really good point that, um, you know, it's probably something that if, if you get to do it, you might get to do it once. And, and so you make all the mistakes probably that, that um, typically we do when we don't know exactly how to go about something um, and could have a major impact there, couldn't it? Yes, it could. It could mean millions of dollars in your pocket and whether you're going to you know, have to go do something else immediately or whether you have to wait three or five years to go do something. Hmm. All right. Now, you talked about being tied to the business and, and I know um, the owner's trap is something you speak about quite a lot. Um, yep. So tell us a little bit what that means, what does the owner's trap mean, and what are some of the things that um, that causes or the the problems that come about from that? Yeah, let me let me give you a very personal experience around that and how it took a while for me to make that mental change in order to literally change the trajectory of of my professional life and the trajectory of the business from the last sale that I did. So, so the owner's trap generally means that you are the primary rainmaker in the business. You are the primary salesperson. And most business owners, depending on your background, as you create a product or you create a service, you're most passionate about it. You're most knowledgeable about it. And you typically are the first salesperson, right? Um, mm. You know, from startup to whatever. And so a lot of business owners don't step back and say, is that really the best role for me as they go through different growth stages of the business? And so... Um, a lot of our business owners that we work with will kind of wake up and say, oh, my God, like I'm doing everything and I'm selling. And if something happens to me, God forbid, I get run over by a bus or, you know, I'm disabled or whatever, you know, the business could die. Um, and so one of the questions we ask is if you left the business for three months, what would happen? Right. And, and in most cases, the, the folks that are in the owner's trap will say we'd probably go out of business because I'm the guy doing all the selling, right? Or the woman doing all the selling. And so that's the concept of the owner's trap. And what we found from a valuation perspective in terms of the value of the business is 
those business owners where they are the primary rainmaker, um, they have about a 30 to 40 percent less value in the business as if you were to go sell. And it has much higher risk in terms of the running of the day to day business. And it's you, you can't step away from the business. Right. And we talk about this concept of a rainmaker versus an architect. And so a rainmaker is the person who is doing all the selling versus I'm an architect and I'm building a sales engine, a sales and lead generation engine that um, then allows the company to scale and to grow and to flourish and is not solely reliant on me. And it has an immediate impact in profits. It has an immediate impact in the value of the business. And most importantly, it has a, an immediate impact on your personal life and whether you can step away and, and, and take some time off to think about the business or make it make a bigger impact in the other things that you want to do. And um, the personal story around this is I sold, I had a consulting firm around the software company called SAP. And for many, many years, I was the rainmaker. I was in the owner's trap and I frankly didn't realize it. And um, at some point in time, I, I made the decision to sell the business. And as I started thinking through what would be valuable to an acquirer and what I wanted to do in my next journey, I realized that if I continued to be the primary rainmaker of the business, um, A, I was probably going to get stuck with the three to five year earnout. B, I knew that it was going to be worth less. And C, it just was, it was not benefiting the company, you know, kind of holistically, universally. Um, and so I, I probably two years before I decided to sell, I started to pull out of the process of me being involved in every deal. And started to put the sales process in place and the people in place that could go sell the business. We saw that was actually doing the selling. We saw an immediate impact in growth. We grew probably 50 to 60% the year that I started to do that, uh, that I started backing away. And then we almost doubled again the next year after that. And what ended up happening, um, I'll tell you the story with KPMG is um, as we were going down the process of selling the business to KPMG, um, we were kind of nine months into the deal, if you will, and it got stuck and I could tell that it was getting stuck. And so I, I talked to my business sponsor, KPMG, who was a senior partner and said, you know, it, it seems to have stalled out. Is there an issue? And he said, you know, to be honest, I'm not really sure what the issue is. And I said, well, who's, who's making the deal? Who's, who's going to kind of get the deal done? And he said, the vice chairman. And I said that I want a meeting with the vice chairman. And he said, the vice chairman of KPMG, really? And I said, if that's the deal, if that's the person that's going to get the deal done, yeah, I want to meet with him. I'll get the deal. I'll get I'll get the deal moving along. Just give me half an hour with the guy. So I get a meeting with this guy in New York City, and we sit down and we talk. And after kind of um, just chit chatting a little bit, I said, you know, I can tell that the deal is stuck. What what what's your concern? Why are we not moving forward? Is it price? Is it terms? What is it? And he said, you know, Pete. He said we've never bought a company where the owner and the CEO was not going with the deal. So to back up from that, we, I had negotiated zero earnout. Okay. I was not going to go with the deal. Hmm. And he said, we've never done that. I want to understand why. And I said, well, first of all, I've been an entrepreneur. This is my fourth company. I'm not going to make a very good employee. You don't want me as an employee. Um, I've done the big company thing, IBM, SAP. I don't want to do that again. I said, but most importantly, what you're buying is not only the book of business and the clients and, and the people, but the people are the ones generating the business. And I said, if you look at the last 12, 12 months, every single client that came in, I, I know who the company is because I obviously signed the contract. But I said, I couldn't tell you the names of anybody that signed these deals. I had no involvement in sales whatsoever. So I'm adding no value to the company. And if you're going to hire me as an employee, I'm going to charge you so much in salary, just it's going to it's going to weaken the deal, right? You're going to you're going to make less money, and that was enough to break through the deal. And so not only did I sell the business for 12 times EBITDA, which is astounding in the services space, but I didn't have any earnout, and it was because I finally realized this concept of the rainmaker's dilemma, as you talk about, as the owner's trap, and got myself out of that and really restructured our whole sales process and the company to to. Uh, to to uh, accomplish that so mm. yeah it's a fascinating um outcome well it's a fabulous outcome um it's a fascinating journey to get there i'm curious 
what your advice is to, you know, even early stage entrepreneurs that may not necessarily be thinking in terms of selling the business right now, but um, this whole concept of that owner's trap that you described and you talked about being tied to the business earlier is, you know, something where they would be tied to the business and they wouldn't be able to take, say, three months off to um, take a vacation, do something else that they like to do and, and the business still continues and thrives and, and in, in your case actually grows when you step away from it. So what's your advice to any entrepreneur, you know, to kind of break out of that owner's trap regardless of whether they're thinking sale right now or not? Yeah, so I, I think the other the other side of the exit piece of it is growth, right? I've never met a business owner that didn't want to grow faster. And those two are inextricably linked, meaning the faster you grow and the more profitable you grow, that's more attractive if you want to sell the business. But regardless of whether you sell or not, to your point, um, it creates a healthy business. And so you cannot scale a business if you are the only person selling, right? And so... You have to change the mindset from, I know it all. It's it's because it's really an ego thing, right? I'm the only one that can sell it perfectly and, and with the passion. And I know the product and I know the services and I know my customers. It's this thing that we all go through in our head. Every entrepreneur I've ever met, right? I'm the only one that can really sell the value of this business. And so if you get out of that mindset, and it's difficult, to, frankly, to take get entrepreneurs out of that mindset into being this architect to say, all right, what do what knowledge do I have in my brain that I can that I can extol to somebody else that I bring into the company that has excellent selling skills, right? To help them be as effective, maybe not as effective as the owner, but effective enough to to go generate revenue. Because then you can go scale that, right? You can create training programs and learning programs and um, all kinds of sales process in order to scale the business. And so. That's the that's the advice that we give to business owners and entrepreneurs is you need to be thinking about being an architect um, and what does that look like and what are the things that you truly think that only you uniquely can do and um, and first of all it's there's very few things that truly only the owner can do right we all again it's kind of an ego thing um, and and getting changing that mindset to all right let's let's figure out what the highest and best use of the of the skills of that business owner, that entrepreneur is, and then everything else, let's go hire people to, to go do that function. And sales is one of the number ones we look at. And it's it's the number one thing that helps scale a company, right? Sales sales fixes a lot of problems. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right. So um what what are some of the um common mistakes you see people making then when they're trying to grow the company and clearly that's that's one that they think only i'm the ceo so nobody else can do it as well as i can do it so i've got to get involved in everything yep so we have this um in fact we have a book coming out hopefully by the end of the year called the four pillars of power and so um, it focuses on those four key areas of the business which i'll review in just a second that creates scale and growth for every business if you do it right. And so the four key pillars of power are team, customers, strategic, or, uh, excuse me, capital, and strategic, strategic execution. And it's in that order. Okay, so starting with team. And what we do in each one of these pillars of power and how we advise business owners is we go through all of the major processes within each one of those pillars and we pick out the one big idea, if you will, that is creates kind of this multiplicative effect that creates explosive growth. And one of the things we've done as a firm is we've looked at uh, explosive growth companies that have done so without a lot of venture capital. All right. And, you know, it's it's pretty easy to grow if somebody gives you $100 million and says, all right, yeah. go, go scale the company. Right. It's another to do it purely organically. So we've done a lot of studying of companies that have grown predominantly through organic means. And, and it's, when we talk about explosive growth, we talk about 1,000% year-over-year growth over a period of time, seven to eight years, okay? And there's not a lot of those firms. And so we've dug pretty deep into them. And we've taken, encapsulated all of those learnings into these four pillars of power, team, customers, capital, strategic execution, and build kind of these big ideas around the process. 
so for instance, in team, right? And most, most CEOs and entrepreneurs and business owners would say, we, we get it. It's all about hiring the right team, right? And then they screw up all pieces of it. And so starting with, you know, how do you recruit people? How do you acquire talent, right? And um, we have a client right now that just is convinced there's nobody smarter than him in the world, right? That he is, yeah. And, and so that, you know, that's kind of a mindset thing, but, you know, we looked at things as simple as a job description. And if you looked at the job description, A, there's no differentiation, there's no personality to the job description. Um, and they, you know, they're just throwing stuff up on Zinc, uh, Zip Recruiter, right? And they're just getting really poor quality and talent in. And so we've really spent a lot of time with them focusing on what we call these outcome-based compelling job requisitions, right? That if you read it, if you as the owner read it, you go, gosh, I want to work for that company. Man, that sounds really cool. They've got this mission. That sounds like the culture is perfect for me. It fits with my style, right? The, the, and, and I'm qualified for the position. And so, you know, from acquiring and, you know, recruiting through the hiring process, through supporting them once they're in the door to uh, managing performance and, 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 you know, truly figuring out a way to light their fire. We've, we've got these kind of big ideas within each one of these steps. And the, the point of these four pillars is each one individually will help a firm grow, right? If you, if you get it right, if you combine them all together, that's where you get this explosive growth. So for instance, on the customer piece of it, you know, we all understand that it's about, you know, making customers happy, right? And we um, are very big users and I've done this for almost 14 years now of this concept called the net promoter score, which measures customer loyalty, right? And there's a huge difference between somebody being satisfied and somebody being loyal. A customer that's satisfied will take a call from your competitor. Somebody who's loyal, won't even take the call and they're out promoting your business to other people without you even doing anything without you asking them. It's not, a, it's not a reference. You know, it's Jurgen out talking about ask my board because he's so impressed with us and we're getting inbound leads because they talk to you and what this net promoter score concept is all about in this methodology is to measure that level of loyalty of a customer. And so the concept is if you have a business has a business, has 100% of your customers at the upper echelon of this customer loyalty score called the net promoter score, then in theory, and actually in practicality, you can spend less money in marketing, advertising, and sales because your customers are out selling for you for $0, right? Hmm. And so what they found out with this net promoter score, and I won't go into the whole story behind it, but they found out is that companies with the highest net promoter scores are more profitable. So if the theory is you spend less money on sales and marketing, you should be more profitable. They've, you know, statistically um, quantify that that is in fact true. So on the customer spectrum of this customer pillar, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, do you have this fanatical, phenomenal customer experience, right? And we've helped companies grow just by fixing that piece of it. Um, you know, they may do great in sales and they get a customer, you know, uh, kind of in the door and then they screw up the execution or they don't talk to them again or, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of reasons that, you know, businesses do this. And so um, if you if you really have this maniacal customer focus, you know, the 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 Marriott's of the world, Apple, to some degree, um, you know, does it more from a product perspective and a service perspective. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of companies that score really high on this net promoter score index and those ones that score high on that index, they are more profitable by a wide margin than their competitors. So, mm. so you know, team customers, those are two things that if there's a huge focus on both of those, frankly, a lot of the other problems kind of get solved. Um, and then, you know, then you've got capital and strategic execution, and there's lots of routes to market and everything else we can talk about. But just even focusing on those two, we can make massive improvements in the growth and the health of the business. Mm, yeah, there's a lot there to unpack. And, I, um, you know, there, there's a, a couple of things you said there. And I, I thought there's a lot of parallels between the, you know, building the team and building the customer base from the perspective of customer experience. So the first one, I guess I wanted to explore a little bit more is the idea of culture 
culture in the business. And, um, you know, you talked about having a mission statement and um, communicating the position description in a way that people will actually look at it and say, wow, I love that culture. That would be a really good fit for my values as well as not, as well as just saying I'm, I have the experience and the knowledge to carry out that role. Um, so talk to us a little bit more about how do you um, build that culture in, in the early phase and how do you then keep that culture vibrant? Because I think culture then plays into bringing on the right people. And if you have the right people and the right culture in place, then you know, you've got the foundation for having that amazing customer ex or giving that amazing customer experience as well. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. You're gonna, you know, and you talk a lot about um, defining your customer, right? What is your what is your ideal customer look like? And in, in a lot mm -hmm. of the consulting that you do, and I'd say it's the same thing with employees, right? With the people, yeah. what kind of people do you really want in the company? And so you're kind of hitting on this. And I think that um, the thing that I always start with is what are the values of the company? And I'll kind of take you back to another personal experience of another business we had. And we started up this company and um, it was just me and another co-founder. And we wrote our manifesto. And this was about a 10 page manifesto. And it basically laid out in details the values of the company that we wanted for, both in terms of the folks that we want to hire and the companies that we wanted to do business with. So then uh, we, we wrote this document and uh, any employee that would come in, any prospective employee that we were serious about, we would have them read this manifesto and we'd say, you know, you either fundamentally, you know, idealistically uh, subscribe to this or you don't. And if you don't, please go join another firm. Right. Hmm. Um, so uh, so we hired the staff. We were up to about 30 people at that point. And it was about five or six years in. And we said, you know, we're five years in. Let's go. And everybody kind of forgot about the manifesto. We actually had them sign it. Uh, but then we kind of put it in a drawer somewhere, right? Uh, we didn't do a good enough job just continuously bring it up. And so five years in, we said, you know, let's let's kind of go resurface that and see how good we were, you know, because we went from startup phase to 30 people. We were going to kind of move to another phase. And to your point, we wanted to see if we had sustained the culture that we thought we started out with. And so we asked everybody through uh, SurveyMonkey, what are the values of the firm? Like, how would you describe them, right? We were going to kind of redo the website and all this kind of stuff. And the values that everybody wrote without ever looking at that manifesto were almost identical to what we laid out in the manifesto, hmm. and which which we were incredibly proud of. And so we we did a good job of, of enabling a culture and hiring the people that fit that culture. And what it comes back to is, what are the values that you're hiring for? And this is one of the things we see from hiring a team perspective in the recruiting is, you know, have you defined the culture, right? And you can define culture in lots of ways. I always define it in terms of what are the values? And those are typically almost always a, an extension of the founder, right? And so as your startup, you have these ideas in your head and, and things that you believe in that unconsciously or consciously, you start hiring people around those kind of values. And as we talk to people about, uh, oh my gosh, this guy's just, he, they, this person just totally screwed up. You know, they were not aligned with us, whatever. And I say, well, align with what, right? Well, align with, you know, they, they wouldn't do this. A customer called up and they wouldn't do this. And I said, ah, so what's your value then? How would you have handled that differently? And so if you start to hire, if you start to define those values and you start to hire to those values, a, that builds the culture. B, you get alignment. And C, um, it's a lot less friction from the CEO, right? You have much less performance problems, personnel problems, when at least in whatever those values are, good, better, and different, you're at least in alignment, right? Hmm. So team, culture, all starts with the alignment of those values. And, and those values are defined, written down, and con you know consciously practice in terms of how you hire and how you fire and, and how you manage folks. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, it, it's, it's funny in, in a way because it's, it's reminded me of our, our exercises that we do to define the ideal customer or the dream customer. And you, you alluded to that. Um, and I've spoken to a number of people about this and said, you know, this will be a great tool to define the ideal employee the yep. ideal team 
team member and then use that as the basis for hiring the people you know you because we talk about defining well we start off defining the values of the business and you know who the business actually is and why they do what they do and then um, look at the dream customer and and seeing where there's the match because the dream customer obviously is aligned with all those values and of course we need to be able to serve them we need to be able to help them achieve their goals in whatever area of expertise that we work in the using that with an a dream employee means that you know you can basically what we're doing is building a match between the business and its dream customer and so you can do that in the same manner with the employees and and I like that you know you talk about the defining self first values of the business values of the business owner and then looking to match the candidates to that value system and the culture right and what i see most business owners do and it's just a, it's a common mistake that we all make and we, we certainly i certainly have in my prior businesses mm-hmm. is we we recruit for um skills of a role as opposed to values right so if you're hiring a salesperson you want to see that they've attain their quota every year for the last five years. That may be great, but that person may be a jerk and they they <laughs> churn and burn customers, right? And they're never gonna fit. And you don't know that unless you're hiring for the values and the culture of the company. Um, and so it is stepping away from traditional ways of, of hiring folks based on you know a certain set of skills or competencies to fit a role and moving much closer to values. You know, certainly they have to have some skills and be competent in whatever you're gonna ask them to do but values come first. So, mm. and, and the same thing with customers. And, and you know, the other, the other thing that came out of this manifesto that we wrote was what kind of customers we wanted to deal with. And we, you know, in, as a startup and as a young company, every piece of business looks like a great piece of business, right? Because it's, it's mm. money in the door. And it is really, really, really hard to turn down a customer request. And, and my quote always is, the business that you don't pursue defines you as much as the business that you do pursue. And we had a, a very, very, very large client that came to us and said, basically, we'll give you $5 million a year to do this one particular project. It was a huge project. And we ultimately said no. And people were thought we were insane. And the reason we said no is we went back to the manifesto. And we were three years old at that point is we knew based on rumors and the industry and just kind of what we were doing that this company treated people like crap. And, um, and we knew that our employees were going to be treated like crap. And um, at that point, the money didn't matter, right? We'd have so many headaches and problems and whatever, and we were not being true to the values that we said we were going to live by. Um, and we, we turned them down and they thought, they thought we we're crazy. They literally said, you, you're turning us down. You don't want our business. We said, that's right. And uh, it was pretty, pretty interesting. And so to your point, it didn't fit with the dream customer. It didn't fit with that profile. And um, it spoke volumes to the employees because they knew why we were turning it down and they knew how difficult of a decision that was, but they knew at the end of the day, we were protecting them. And I can tell you that paid off in spades in terms of their loyalty. We, We had zero turnover from basically that point forward for till we sold the company. Um, zero. Uh, we had we had two people that left because of personal personal situations, but not because somebody went to a competitor. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's. I mean, you you send a pretty strong signal um, when you focus on your employees first, and you know you talked about customers as as the second big pillar and i think uh, i can't remember who to attribute this to but a quote i heard was you know take a look after it might have been richard branson look after your employees first because they will then look after your customers yep it was richard branson hmm. and the, the containers the ceo of the container store also has a big book about that as well so yeah all right um so one of the questions i have for you and and this has sort of been prompted by that conversation is how do you define success you know you you turn down this five million dollar uh, 
contract and that i mean you know five million dollars extra in the bottom line even for a, a, a sizable company um, probably was very very significant and yet you turned it down so you know how yeah. how does that play into your definition of success yeah i think that um we've come across companies that will grow at any cost and i think that silicon valley is rife with kind of that notion, right? There's just so many companies that raised hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars, and it was gone in a very short period of time because they just grew at any cost. And so um, clearly success is defined by the individual, but for us, we define success as does, are, are we living to the values? Me personally, as a business owner and entrepreneur, am I living to the values that I believe in and that I said that we built a company on. It's probably first and foremost. Um, second would be, um, you know, do I not just enjoy, but do I respect all the people that are around me? You know, there's, there's a common notion of every employee that comes in, you know, you want to go, quote, you want to go have a beer with them or have a barbecue. And I don't believe in that because we had employees that I didn't want to hang out with the night, but man, did I respect them because of their intelligence, because of their values. Uh, you know, we didn't have any uh, anything else in common, so I didn't, didn't necessarily want to hang out with them. And I think that people get into this, you know, they'll use that as a way to also not have a diverse employee base, um, truthfully. Um, and so uh, I also define success based on, you know, looking around and saying, A, I, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room, and B, do I really respect and and admire the the folks that I brought on board and 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 are they happy and are they are they here because not because they have to be but are they here because they want to be um, and that was how I defined success and I knew that if I did that the rest of the stuff for the most part would take care of themselves and they did. Mm. Yeah, there's so much there in terms of defining a healthy culture i think that that is really important and you know it's probably if we all live by that more in in the bigger environment that things might improve um at at some macro levels as well um, you talked about respect there respect for other people even though they might be um you know that whilst there's shared values and culture in the organization there might be sufficient differences that you say well you know in in a personal sense that that person's definitely not my best friend or you know we don't have enough in common um, and you also talked about how that mindset will actually enable you to have a diverse team and and i'm guessing that part of that is not just you know the diversity of of um well gender and race and um ethnicity and religion and all the other things that that you know we understand when we talk about diversity but also um, diversity of thought diversity of opinion that actually contributes to um, a rich cultural and um, intellectual environment and brings in ideas from a whole range of different backgrounds and contributions that that will enhance the culture and the organization we we, um, we created a bunch of new services and really improved the business we built we went from zero percent recurring revenues to the last couple of years i'd say 30 percent of the business was recurring revenue and that came from folks that um had that diversity of thought that we would have never thought that these innovative ideas would have come from this particular group of people or, you know, a couple of individuals specifically for a number of reasons. And it was that, and thank God we had that diversity of thought because they came up with some brilliant ideas and we implemented those ideas and did a lot of testing and um, it resulted in just really making the business stronger. And so you're, you're a hundred percent on the mark. It's that diversity of thought and, and the owner's ability to, to listen and put the ego aside and say, okay, Right. Uh, I'm not the person with all the ideas or the best ideas that ideas come from every corner and from from every person. And if you just open and you listen, right, and you respect opinions, whatever, that stuff will come out. Hmm. If you give them a chance. Right. All right. Well, um, what what are some things that I mean, there's there's 
yeah, we're in this um, post COVID pandemic world, and some countries are doing better coming out of it at the other side than than others. And I've got a strong opinion here about how Australia is mismanaging this. But I'll leave the politics aside and I'll just ask you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, given given the situation we're in right now, and I think there's there's actually lots of opportunities that perhaps weren't there before because of all this change that's happening and and developments that have been forced on us through COVID and and what's happened over the past couple of years. Um, what are some of the things that every business can do that you know perhaps in in the next few months that can actually put them in a really strong position to grow, to be successful coming out of, of the environment we're in? You know, um, I think, I'd say first and foremost, get really close to your customers, really understand what pains they have, how you're solving the problem and how you're doing it uniquely. And one of the exercises we take our, our clients through is either they'll let us do this or we'll have them do it. But Go back and talk to your customers and ask them why they bought from you versus somebody else. I'm talking more from a B2B sense, but even in the B2C scenario, you can still do the same thing. If you know if you're selling on Amazon, it might be a little bit more difficult. But communicating with your customers about why did they buy from you and why did they not buy from a competitor, right? And really understanding what were those reasons and getting closer to customers can help. Um, in a bunch of ways. It can help both from a customer loyalty perspective. It can help you create new products and services and maybe serve them in unique ways. You hadn't thought about that. In, you hadn't thought about them pre-COVID, right? Because their their lives have changed too, right? And so I could, I could generically say every business is now a digital business, right? Which mm. is fundamentally true. Um, and so, um, you know, but I think a lot of that stuff will come out of these deeper level conversations with, with, a, a, with a customer base. And um, I have interesting conversations in my household about, you know, the bad Amazon and bad, you know, these bad big companies, right? And there are, there's definitely some practices I don't agree with. But at the end of the day, Jeff Bezos has built an amazing company because he's had this maniacal focus on making our lives better, right? And it's addicting now. You can go order something and get it in a day mm. versus getting in a car and going to the store, buy, you know, and then in return it with no hassle. That's pretty addictive. That's a, that's an addictive, right? And that's not a bad thing. And so I think the same thing with entrepreneurs is to be thinking about how can you take that customer experience to a completely different level, right? And almost in an uncomfortable way from the, from the company's perspective, right? Just, and so that's the one thing I would say over the next couple of months is start talking to customers, maybe, you know, and if you can talk to, customers that didn't buy from you and why they didn't buy from you, I think some nuggets will come out of those conversations and then turning those back on the company and saying, how can we use this new knowledge to really, you know, again, take that customer experience to a whole new level. You know, Amazon's working right now on one hour delivery, um, right? That's just for any household anywhere in the world, right? Like that's just an in insane concept, right? You can't even get to a store and back and buy something in an hour, yeah. right? That's right. <laughs> but that's literally what they're working on. And so I think we can look at companies like Amazon and, and whether however you feel about them, whatever, it doesn't really matter, and just say these guys are completely maniacally focused on that customer experience. And so I think every company has the ability to do that. And the ones that do that strategically and better than the others, they're the ones that are going to win at the end of the day because there's so much choice. I don't care what you sell, what product or service you sell, there's lots of options out there, mm. right? Yeah, that's that's really great advice. And I, I certainly, I had a, an experience recently with Amazon and, and um, it, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's one, and I'm talking about it now. So, you know, it's what you said earlier about uh, customers then becoming loyal fans. So basically we bought something that um, I couldn't get it working, and it was probably my fault. It wasn't. It was probably um, an issue with you know, and and part of it was I probably bought the wrong thing. Uh, but you know, there was no questions asked at all. The refund was provided within a day, and and I said, well, how do I return this thing? And they said, oh, look, 
send it to recycling or yeah or keep it yeah so i've got this thing that sort of half works so i can make use of it but i i feel sort of happy that it didn't cost me anything it, it's not serving the purpose that i intended it for but it, at least i can make some use of it and it's kind of funny right because i think we steal ourselves to be ready for this really horrible experience like they're going to yeah. ask all these questions and it's going to take weeks to get my money and it's going to be this runaround so when you just have an experience like that, you're like, oh my God, like that's what that's what it should be all the time, everywhere, right? And mm -hmm. unfortunately, and it's why Amazon has grown to be the way it is, truly. Because yeah. they've been doing it for 20 years. Mm. So maniacal focus on the customer. That's that's the big thing. Yeah. And yep. and certainly as you as you point out correctly, I, we've, I mean it's not just my business, if I'm looking out, that's um, had to make changes because of COVID. Everybody's had to make changes because of COVID. So if we go out and talk to people and say, well, what what's the impact been on you and what's your environment like today compared to, say, 18 months ago and how can we help um, take advantage of the opportunities that come out of that, um, then, you know, that that is that is um, customer focus at its best talking to the customer yeah. and really exploring to that and then then you know you, you point out the ego i mean that's come up as a theme today you know sort of stepping away from the business and and bringing the team on board certainly requires us to let go of our egos as business owners and um talking to the customers and listening and taking on board the feedback also does that yeah and i think you know from that perspective one of the things that COVID has introduced is what is the concept of a team, right? And this has kind of been happening for a while with freelancers, but um, I think that whole world has changed. Unless you have a physical location, you have a retail store, right? Team could be anywhere, anybody, anywhere around the world, mm. right? And so, and there's tons of freelancer sites from Upwork to, uh, my God, there's a ton of them to, um, I want to hire the absolute best person and they're not in Sydney, right? I'm not yeah. sure if you're in Sydney or Melbourne where you're at, but they're in America or they're in the UK or they're in Taiwan. You know, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's some things that obviously are impacted, time zone differences, language, whatever. But point is, the talent pool is the world and it's mm. bigger than it's ever been. And COVID has really accelerated that through just Zoom and whatever. You know, all these tools now that we have the ability to to collaborate and communicate from you know, Teams to Zoom to Slack to whatever, we can we can be way more integrated as a virtual team than ever than ever before. So, yeah, and and you talked about diversity or you discussed diversity before, and that certainly has opened up, you know, this whole area of um, that that we can really bring diversity into our teams. And I this is one that really excites me for several reasons. I mean, first of all, you know, you mentioned that now all of a sudden. Um, the talent pool that's available to us can be anywhere in the world. I think the other thing, this this um, trend to, you know, or the the light that's gone on that, that people have realised, hey, working from home is actually something that can work for many roles that we have. I think that's opened up uh, another talent pool, which, you know, is perhaps... Um, people that have young families that want to spend more time with their young families and have actually gone out of the corporate world because their focus has been their young family. And, and now all of a sudden there's an opportunity where they can um, spend that time with their young family, but at the same time engage in some employment and supplement their income because they can work from home and they can work in a time frame that suits that family um, lifestyle that they want. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you a very, yeah, I'll tell you a really personal story there as well. So there's an airline over here. I don't know if they're in Australia or not, but called JetBlue. And um, if you call up for, for years and years, JetBlue got the number one ranking for customer service of any airline in the world. Okay, for many, many, I don't know what the case is anymore. But um, and so I'd ask people all the time, I said, do you know where JetBlue's call center is? And they say, I, we assume it's in Boston because they have a big, hub, a big hub in Boston. And the answer was no. They're in the homes of about 300 people, mostly in Utah. Hmm. Like, what are you talking about? And I said they had this, um, they would give them an, an IP phone, basically. And they found 
uh, predominantly women, but people that wanted to work on their hours, whatever, and they kind of had built the scheduling technology. And when you were calling a JetBlue customer service person, you literally were calling in somebody's house. Yeah. So we we took that model and we created a business process outsourcing business of our company that had about 45 to 50 percent net margins. And uh, this was happened to be in the kind of import export area. And we created this business unit where we would essentially outsource that function of, of different companies. And instead of, for instance, uh, outsourcing it in India or wherever, we found people that had gone out of industry that were certified in that particular specialty that got out of the workforce for whatever reason. Typically, they were choosing to raise a family. But to your point, they wanted to work some hours and they wanted additional income. And we found about, I don't know, 20 or 30 of these folks around the country. We connected them all through technology. And we beat out IBM and HP. We beat out every large company for this business as a small company that we were because of that model. And any entrepreneur can do this. They can use that exact same model. So again, COVID has really accelerated that. We were doing this uh, 10 years ago. Um, and we were doing it from a cost perspective, cheap as cheaper, cheaper than you can outsource anything in India with way better talent. Literally, these were you know, tenured professionals that were certified in this particular, this particular trade that you could hold any one of them up to 10 people anywhere else and, and they'd blow them away. So, mm. yeah, yeah, I think there's huge opportunities there. And, and so, yeah, that's great. The other one that I, I, you know, I've had this vision for a long time because I, I in my corporate days, I was working a, a global role. And, um, you know, we had um, research facilities all around the world. And I think today we're, if we're not producing physical product, if we're producing things that, you know, can be handed off in terms of information, the idea of um, spending eight hours in the US, perhaps like the typical workday, working on this particular project, then handing it off to the next time zone, and then them handing it off to the next time zone, um, you could probably do four time zones to send it around the world before it comes back to that first time zone. And essentially, the project is being worked on 24 hours nonstop. And yep. the kind of, you know, we talked about customer experience. I mean, imagine uh, saying to a customer, you know, the turnaround time for this project is probably a third to a quarter of what, you normally expect and it's going to, and the quality is going to be as good or better than what you've got in the past we're, we're advising a client right now that is in the um uh, i'll keep them secret they're in the erp space and they have a client on the west coast in california that is um it's a huge company it's a huge pharmaceutical company and the ceo is um very impatient, like most CEOs are. And they basically asked to take a 21 month project to 13 months. Hmm. And for about a month, they kept saying, You're crazy. There's no way we can do it. There's no way we can do it while they were working on the back end, doing exactly what you just said. So now they're covering three time zones. Hmm. They figured out some really good handoffs. And so there's a two or three hour overlap with basically each time zone. And they've finally agreed this week that they're going to do it in 13 months and they could they could probably do it faster um but um for, for that exact reason so they they kind of figured that out mm, right well i love to see that people are actually doing that and i wish i <laughs> had have taken steps to actually implement something like that but uh, that was in my corporate life and um you know we could talk about that for ages too but uh, anyway I think it's a good point now, though, to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to primarily help our audience um, who are leaders and innovators in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions related to innovation and project management. Um, hopefully, you'll give us some answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. I hope I have some, some a little bit of wisdom from my years that, that I can provide. <laughs> What, what do you think is the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? 
Uh, let's see. As a, at a company level or individual level or both? Either or both. Yeah. Sure. I, I think that um, we should all not go to college, not go to university, not go to elementary school and think like a bunch of kids. Um, no. And I'm only half kidding. Yeah. But I think as you get older and as, as I, I think, I think as, as people, as you get older, you become less risk tolerant, right? And innovation is all about taking risk and stubbing your toe and saying, well, that didn't work. I'm going to kind of turn a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left, or I'm going to do this a little bit differently. And you, and as a kid, right, you just do that instinctively. Hmm. And nobody said you failed, right? You just fell down or you scraped your knee or you broke your arm or whatever, but you keep kind of going after it. And, and at some point in time in our lives, either through formal education or whatever, we stop doing that. Hmm. Um, and again, I'll kind of use the Amazon example. Jeff Bezos has never stopped doing that. He talks very publicly about big screw ups they've had at the company and products have failed. But Prime, you know, the whole notion of Prime came out of making a bunch of mistakes and taking learnings from here and learnings from there and learnings from there, kind of combining it all together. And now it is the biggest growth engine of the company. Same thing with AWS. And so I think as a uh, back to kind of the culture, you know, if if innovation is one of the values, right, you're going to hire, hopefully you'll hire people that already instinctively are continuous learners and are not afraid of failure. And if you are the CEO and you've got this ego and failure is a bad word, you're not going to innovate. Um, and um, yeah, um, I can't remember her name, but the founder of Spanx talked about every day that she came home, her dad asked her, what did you fail at today, honey? And it's a crazy question for a father to ask. And so she, you know, she talks a lot about, you know, just that, that um, the lesson of failure, and that's where innovation comes from. It's not failing, it's you learn something, right? Thomas Edison, yeah. a thousand failures before he came out of the light bulb, right? So yeah. it's part of its mindset. And part of it is the execution. Once you change that mindset, it's the execution of just keep trying some stuff, right? And that's where innovation comes from. And it usually comes from these places that you never expect it, right? You're like, oh my God, that idea yeah. came from because I was trying something over here and getting outside of your industry too. And I think back to the diversity of thought, if you hire people from outside that core industry, um, the companies that do that really well and the strategy firms that do that well, they look at across all these different verticals and pick those, cherry pick those lessons to say, let's apply this business model or this way of working to this particular industry and see if it works, right? And that's where innovation mm -hmm. comes from. So look outside your industry, you know, embrace failure, celebrate failure hmm. and dig into it. Do these after action reports to figure out why did it fail? And it's usually not people. It's and it's usually not the idea. It's just the execution of how it was executed. Right. Hmm. Or yeah. Time. And, yeah, I think this um, idea and, you know, it comes back to culture a little bit as well as uh, of celebrating failure in a way that, um, yes, of course, don't take um, ridiculous risks, but at the same time, um, you know, you've you've learned something, so let's celebrate that learning, and let's let's look at that failure in terms of what have we learned, and how can we make a little change? Because sometimes it's just a little change, right? And and you talked about thinking like a kid. Um, you know, I don't I don't know of anyone that um, any one or two year old that when they started walking and fell down the first time said, "Oh, I, I give guess, up." I guess I give, I guess I'll have to try something else. I give up. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I failed. I failed. I'm not going to do yeah. this anymore. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Um, I think it's a combination of looking outside the industry and hiring those people. I th we we did that from hiring people outside of an industry. Um, in my last forum, I mentioned that we had some mm. folks that, um, you know, our recurring revenue business and, and frankly this operating model of this business process outsourcing unit that we had both came from hiring folks not completely outside the industry but came w with some very very different perspectives hmm. um, and then we regularly had um, we would do quarterly business reviews and the majority of the time we would spend talking about kind of the where the business was at at that point and what the focus was coming in the future but we would also have a session where we talk about, you know, what new products and services can we introduce? And um, we would just throw up really crazy, wacky, stupid ideas, stupid ideas, right? And then 
kind of work through all those and say, what, what makes enough sense to, to at least then go try out, right? Um, and then we would go do that. And so it was this very active, conscientious, strategic thinking about innovation that I think helped out. Mm. Yeah, and I like the, the concept of looking at other industries and bringing inputs in from those other industries, I think is a, a really um, great way to do it because a lot of innovation is connecting dots between sort of seemingly disparate things on the surface, right? That's right. That's exactly mm. right. All right. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? <laughs> um, my brain. No, you know, I I read a lot. Um, I read probably thirty to forty books a year, um, mm -hmm. of which probably more than half of those are kind of business related books. And so I wouldn't say that I have a single resource. I think I just I try to expose myself to so much information and ideas and concepts and. You know, I do I listen to podcasts, I listen to your podcasts, you know, um, and just talking to people. And I think to your point of connecting the dots, um, I don't think there's any kind of one central repository. I go, boom, that's where I get all my ideas. It's just this connecting of dots with a bunch of stuff that's swirling around in my head with, you know, seemingly no context and no no structure to it. It just sometimes will just go pop, boom. Hmm. It's usually in the middle of the night or it's in the shower. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> When, when the mind's at rest, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it, we live in this marvelous age, don't we, where we've got access to all this information. And I, I guess the, the danger in some ways is there's so much information that we get a little overwhelmed at times. Yep, exactly. Hmm. It is very true. I think we, you know, um, so Michael Gerber is famous for um, coining this concept. It wasn't his, but he coined the concept, popularized the concept of it's not, it's the who, not the how, right? Mm. And I think, I think entrepreneurs and business owners get caught up in the, I need to know how to do this, mm. right? And, and I do this all the time. I did it today and it really, I had to, I had to shame myself into kind of getting out of what I was doing and finding the, the who, right? Finding the person that is the best or expert at this or much better than, you know, we could ever be um, because that accelerates learning, learning that um, accelerates innovation and accelerates growth. Um, and so I think that is the danger of having all this information. It's we, we, we want more and more and more so that we can become the expert. And really what we should be focusing on is those resources and those sites and those places where we go find the person that knows that, not the knowing, if that makes any sense. It's the who, not the how. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. All right. Now, what, what's the best way to keep a project on track? Or a client wow. on track well, if, you're if you're working with, with someone to help them grow their business or get it ready for sale? Yeah, I, I tell you, I've been this, uh, this is all I've done for 25 years, basically, <laughs> in, in all these large business systems and these, keeping these very large projects on track. And it's really, really hard. I think it is, it's this, um, so if you look at the Rockefeller habits, he talks about the daily huddle, right? I think that's one way is, is really understanding what are the focus items. And if you have more than three, you don't have any focus, right? Um, mm. And so it is, what are those, what are those needle moving types of activities, types of things that you can be focused on that really will make a fundamental difference. And looking at that every morning, I, I, put my goals in place. And I look at my goals literally three times a day, at least three times a day. And so I think from a project perspective, whatever the project is, whether it's a strategic initiative in a company, whether it's, um, you know, putting your processes, but whatever it is, I think it is the concentrated focus and, and the, the conscientious and invisible, um, you know, focus of taking a look at it and say, what do I need to be doing today? Even if you break it up into increments, right? to kind of move the ball a little bit forward and just making sure you don't get off track. And, um, you know, a week in this business arena is a long time, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you, if you let something go a week, um, if it's, I mean, if it's important and strategic, that, that's a long time. Um, and, you know, I always kind of use this analogy if, you know, in, in the U S if I was to walk from New York to LA and every mile I moved an inch to the right, I'll end up in Seattle. Hmm. Okay. Just an inch. And so it may not feel like you're moving very far, like it's imperceptible, 
but at some point, you know, when you're 300 miles in, you're like, crap, I'm in Kentucky. I'm supposed to be you know, wherever, yeah, yeah. You, you know, use your geographic metaphor, but um, it's that just daily, really kind of looking where you're at and, and focusing on the things that have to get cleared out of the way. So mm. that, that's the best I can give. I mean, there's mm. all kinds of time management things and project management techniques and whatever, but it, it's focus. That's it. Mm. Yeah. And the power of focus is, is quite amazing. And, you know, to speak to your metaphor, I mean, the um, making adjustments all the time to, you know, to keep on that focus. I mean, if you think of an aircraft, I think the statistics say that an aircraft, you know, let's say it's traveling from, where was it, Boston to LA, the... Yeah. Um, about eighty to ninety percent of the time, it's actually off course, but it's continually right. it's continually correcting course correcting so that it actually ends up landing at at LA airport. And um, the so the idea of of the focus and and adapting the course correcting the course so that the target will actually be achieved is really important. Yeah, that's that's a super great metaphor. Um, I had the 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 benefit of a, I was with a company for a very short period of time, and the CEO was a pilot, uh, and so we flew from our headquarters to to Cleveland, and it was a single engine plane, very small plane, prop plane, and first time I'd ever done this in terms of that that distance, right? Not a normal commercial airliner, and every five minutes or so, he would call control tower to control tower to control tower. And so as we're kind of talking through the headphones, I said, oh, I assume you're just kind of letting them know that we're up here. And he goes, no, exactly to your point. He says, I'm correcting course every time I call the air traffic control. I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, exactly. He goes, exactly to your point. He's like, oh, I'm off course, I'm off course. And so it was literally every five minutes, control tower to control tower from at that point, Cleveland to, Cleveland to, um, to DC, which was you know an hour, hour and a half late. Hmm. So it was that constant readjustment along the way. Yeah, yeah, it's a great metaphor. All right, um, and what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Wow, that's a really big question to end it with. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, at the end of the day, differentiation is only in the mind of the buyer, of the customer, mm. right? That's it. Mm. And I, we spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs, particularly ones that want to exit, Talking them down from the, my unique IP is so valuable, somebody should pay a bazillion dollars for it, mm. right? And our, our line that we've used for a long time is the first person that tells you what your business is worth will never get the deal. These are the one to tell you that your, your baby's ugly. And so it comes down to this notion of differentiation is, um, you know, we all believe that we're differentiated and, you know, we try to push that through marketing and sales and, and whatever. But at the end of the day, the only one that can say you're differentiated is the customer. Um, and so that's why we talked a little while ago about, you know, really getting close to your customers and ask that question. Why did you buy from us versus mm -hmm. my competitor? Um, and usually we found probably definitely more than half of the time, the answer is always different than what you believe it was, mm -hmm. right? Almost every time. And it's usually, and, and if, if you're really listening openly, um, to those answers, you'll create your differentiation statement, right? And then you can really double down on it. And if, if there's, if, you know, if it's one customer, that's one thing. If it's, if it's kind of a collection of customers, um, then, you know, you listen and, and you, you really double down on the different, assuming that those are your dream customers, those are your ideal customers, right? You double down on whatever that differentiating statement is. And the one thing that we hear all the time is service. It's my service, right? And I can tell you from a acquirer's perspective, that is, it's discounted all the time because if service is truly your differentiator, it has to be scalable. And usually mm -hmm. service means I, as the business owner, I'm so close to the, you know, I'm close, so close to the customer, I know them by name. Yeah. That's not scalable and it's not differentiated, right? Um, and so, uh, and so, you know, if it's service and service by service, it's, hey, I know Jurgen by name and I've got a cell phone number and he can call me anytime. That's not a differentiation statement. And so it's again, it's really kind of thinking, listening to customers and 
And if that is the differentiation, that's a problem, right? You're in the owner's trap. So mm -hmm. some work got to be done on that. And you have to figure out what it is I do as an owner um, that adds value to that customer relationship, right? That I can pull away from me and create it as an offering, if you will, as, as the fundamental service of the company. Because uh, that's the only way you scale and grow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really important point is, uh, you know, understanding the differentiator from the client's perspective, but then um, focusing in and strengthening those differentiators that are actually scalable. Right, exactly. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Pete. This has been absolutely fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you, about Ask My Board, and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Yeah, absolutely. So they can uh, find us at askmyboard.com. A S K M Y B O A R D. And then my email is P Martin, P M A R A R T I N at smyboard.com. Great. So we'll post the links in the show notes so people can click straight through. Now, do you have some parting advice for our listener today? Just listen to what Jurgen says and what his guests say. <laughs> I mean, you have really, truly, I mean, you just have great content. And I know you're doing this not to serve your business, you're doing this to serve other people. Um, and uh, it's that, you know, if you want to be innovative, if you want to grow, it's just learning. You know, we're all kind of on this learning journey together. And I, I think the, the folks that are truly focused on helping other people, um, you can gain a lot from them and just, you know, try to figure out the who, not the how, and you'll, you'll grow. So, and just get the right team. And that's part of getting the right team. It's the who. Yeah. Okay, well, focus on the who. That's that's a really great parting message. And thanks for your kind words there. Um, and finally, who else should I have on this podcast and why? Wow. Think you can get Bezos? He's not too busy right now. <laughs> yeah, you know? he, he might be in space soon. <laughs> or Richard, Richard Branson? He's got some proud, some good stories to tell right Yeah. Um. Nobody's popping to mind right now, but I'm, I'm happy to follow up kind of after this and, and give you some suggestions. So, Okay. Yeah. Well, um, talking to Beat, well, it's as we record this, it's the 14th of July, and I think he's scheduled to make his space flight visa. So uh, Branson did last week. He's due to go this coming weekend on the 19th. Yep. I think it's the, an the anniversary. Is it the 50... Must be the fifty second anniversary of the moon landing, the first moon landing. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. So it'll be that'll be really cool. I speak to him while yeah. he's up there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. That's really good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, um not sure we can make that happen at such short notice, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it some I'll give it some thought. <laughs> we can only try. JBZO at Amazon.com. I'm sure he'll respond quickly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights so generously today, um, Pete. I've I've really enjoyed this. There's been so much value in this conversation. I really hope that the listener takes some action as a result of what they heard today. I wish you all the best for the future, and let's stay in touch. I would love to do that. Thanks, Jurgen. I appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that insightful and really informative, inspirational conversation with Pete and took something away from his episode. His four pillars of power framework is something I really like. Essentially, the map of systems and processes for a business under the pillars of team, customers, capital and strategy. I'm curious to know what you took away from Pete's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Pete Martin. That is P-E-T-E-M-A-R-T-I-N. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Pete Martin. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Pete, as well as links to the Ask My Board website his social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about today in our conversation. If you like this episode, please do share it with as many other people that you think it might help. Tag me in on that share and I will reach out to you with a special surprise thank you. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up. 
including storyteller and creator Paul Socket and author Tom Poland from Leedsology. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.